Hello, everybody. Thanks a lot for the organizing, for, for organizing and for inviting me. And I want you to look at this picture and panic, because what it means is that uh, while Morocco is only the third producer, thank you, in the world, it holds 50, it holds by large the largest reserves of phosphate in the world. 50 billion out of a total of 71 billion. This is about 75%. And if you can imagine these same figures for oil, you would be very scared. So what I want to argue in this talk is that this is not, phosphate is not a natural gift that Morocco happens to have. Uh, this took some work for Morocco. First of all, you need to discover phosphate, you need to count it, you need to compare it to other reserves, you need to be able to sell it. But also, uh, you see that Western Sahara is counted as part of Moroccan phosphate. This was not always the case. Morocco conquered the Western Sahara in 1975. So I want to tell the story of the phosphorus apparatus in Western Sahara, in particular, prospecting and finding phosphorus, moving phosphorus and selling phosphorus into the international markets. And I want to do it uh, through geopolitics, by paying attention to the geopolitics of fertilizer. And I want to start with this paradox that I just mentioned, that uh, Western Sahara phosphate is counted as part of Moroccan phosphate, but not a single country in the, Euro in the United Nations considers the Western Sahara as part of Morocco. So Moroccan sovereignty over the Western Sahara is not recognized legally, but it is de facto recognized by the fact that every country in the world almost buys at some point or some other phosphate from Morocco that has actually been extracted in the Western Sahara. So my story begins in the 19... Whoop, in the 1940s, when uh, France had a virtual monopoly of producing um, fertilizers in Europe. Why? Because it had, um, because the producers of raw phosphates in North Africa were, happened to be French colonies, most of them. So after World War II, France was not good friends with Franco in Spain. What they did was not selling fertilizers with Franco. As you may know, Franco was a sympathizer of Hitler, so uh, he didn't have many friends. Uh, uh, point. So Spain needed fertilizers. It couldn't get them from France. They decided to go to their colony in Western Sahara, which by the time was a Spanish colony, and look for the phosphates. Uh, they sent a bunch of geologists. They found some phosphates, but they were not of very good quality. So they decided to look here in the coast, and one of the things that they produced was the first geological map of Western Sahara, published in 1952. After some years, they gave up on phosphates because of their bad quality. They called in a bunch of international companies to look for oil in Western Sahara. These companies also gave up. They didn't find anything, but they left behind uh, very good geophysical maps of the region and new geophysical technology for prospecting. So in 1961, the Spanish government came back to looking for phosphate in the region. And they did so with new knowledge of phosphate genesis. Now it was well known that phosphates in northern Africa were produced uh, in the bottom of the oceans and lifted by convection during extended geological periods. Uh, so what they found out is that this red zone here is a Paleozoic coast, is a Paleozoic coast in which uh, the phosphate-bearing phosphate, phosphate -bearing layers were to be found. So they did a bunch of correlations. As you can see, phosphate in Western Sahara is pretty deep down the earth. So they did correlations following phosphate through the Paleozoic coast until they found a very rich layer here. Um, 1,600 million tons of 68% average quality with some peaks of 80, which is a lot. So Spain decided that this was a very good opportunity to go into the booming international market of fertilizers. This is 1964, which is when the Green Revolution is starting and some other developments. In order to sell to the international markets, um, 
Spain had to alter the post-colonial fertilizers market in Europe. As I said before, during the colonial period, France had a virtual monopoly over North African phosphates. In 1956, Morocco and then other French colonies obtained independence through war and things like that. So the French started complaining that the post-colonial market was ruled by anarchy, by which, of course, they meant that they could not control it anymore, right? Morocco was strong enough to negotiate prices with France. So the Western Sahara phosphates were an opportunity for France to downplay Morocco a little bit because Morocco was the larger producer in North Africa, but it was also a very good opportunity for North American companies, Florida companies, to get into the European, into what they call the European natural market. The reasoning was if we can uh, build, well, this is the phosphate found, this is the situation of Western Sahara and its so-called natural market. The reasoning of, of American companies was if we can build transformation plants in either Western Sahara, Morocco, or Spain, we will be able to compete with France in the, in the European market. Intense negotiation followed, and I'm not going to, to go into the details. I just published a paper in Technology and Culture where you can find some of it. It's interesting both scientifically and politically, but uh, this is maybe not the time. So at the end of the process, Spain and Morocco signed um, an agreement, a secret agreement, by which they would agree in not going into a, a price war. Right? So they would agree in keeping minimum prices, and this allowed Spain to start selling Western Sahara phosphate in the international markets. And this happened in 1973. In 1974, a new player came into the picture, which is the Polisario Front. So it's the Saharawi guerrilla for the liberation of, of Western Sahara. And what they did, the first thing they did once they were constituted were, was burning down the conveyor belt that was transporting for 100 kilometers phosphate from the mine into the port. So they burned 14 kilometers of that. The Spanish government realized that if the Polisario Front had the power of disrupting the flow of oil, the situation was unsustainable, so they offered the Saharawi a referendum. The moment the Moroccan uh, monarchy heard of this referendum, they decided to uh, step in because they didn't want Western Sahara phosphates to be out of control. So they launched what is called the Green March. And by late 1975, the Spanish and Moroccan governments signed a secret agreement by which basically Spain gave over the country, gave over Western Sahara to Morocco in exchange of, some, of keeping some rights in fishing industries and particularly in phosphates. So uh, I think that was this, what this story shows is that putting phosphate rock at the center of stories about refugees, I didn't mention, but the Sahrawi people are were expelled of the land. 100,000 of them are living in Algeria in refugee camps of Tindouf. So you put phosphate rock at the center of the story of the Saharawi, at the center of the story of recolonization. Western Sahara is considered today the last of the African colonies, and most people don't even know. Whenever the issue is raised in the European nations, uh, something interesting uh, happens. Morocco has promised to conduct a referendum. Whenever somebody threatens to sanction Morocco for not doing that, then there are a bunch of countries, mostly France and the US, that complain uh, and stop it because obviously they want to keep getting the phosphate. We put phosphate rock in the middle of the creation of global markets, and global markets need to be manufactured. They also require lots of work. Some of this work is violent, some of this work is scientific. And we, of course, and as we are doing in this panel, we put phosphate rock at the center of food security issues and more generally um, how to feed 7 billion people. So thank you very much.